this computer. Okay, so um, Bob can do an intro of himself. Uh, if you don't know who Bob is, you should look him up and find out because he's probably been one of the most famous uh, and influential living people in the field right now. And so you should know who Bob Heath is if you don't. But after this talk, I'm sure you'll know what he uh, can tell you about public relations. Well, we'll see. That's always in the, uh, the test, isn't it? Uh, I'm interested in talking about history because I think a lot of people don't pay much attention to history. And one of the things that worries me is that too often we only educate people five years of literature back. And so they only know what's been written in the last five years, not what's been written in the last several hundred years. I also am convinced that one of the most important aspects of studying the history of public relations is to try to agree upon what public relations is. Uh, because if we don't know what it is, we don't share a common definition, we don't know when it began and what it has been and where it's going and all the rest of that. So I think that history is, is really important. Uh, there's only one conference that really focuses enthusiastically on history and that's Tom Watson's and he's now retired, but at Burnmouth in South England. And I attended that three or four times and found it all to be very good and can kind of use that as my launching point because one of the things that happens in a conference like that is that somebody will have spent the last four or five or six or seven years trying to pour through documents to find when somebody was mentioned as a lobbyist or when somebody was first mentioned as a public relations person or a public affairs person or a government relations person. And I've said to myself, I cannot imagine how anyone can endure that kind of intellectual uh, rigor, because when you find out the answer to that, can't you always assume that somebody out there will find one two weeks earlier and therefore your entire life work will be shattered? I am in sort of an iconoclast because so many people like to believe that public relations began somehow in the, in the 1800s, the 19th century in the United States. And there's certainly evidence of it becoming fairly prominent at that time. And we'll build up to that. <clears throat> but I'm also the kind of person that when I went to <clears throat> a conference like that in Burnmouth that I would say, well, can we imagine, and of course, having been to Australia, which is one of the oldest, uh, somewhat consistent, enduring cultures in the entire world, the Aboriginal people, undoubtedly when they're putting something up on rocks that long ago, those had meanings, which one could imagine as having something to do with public relations. So we have media, but it's rocks and hand paint and such. Um, I'm one that says, well, we've been doing public relations for a long time, and the fact that we didn't get around to naming it until somewhere in the 1800s, the 1900s, and so forth, does that mean that it never existed before that? I'm very much an historian. As a matter of fact, in my doctoral study, I had minor in history, and I began actually to write on, I was a rhetoric major, essentially, public speaking, organizational communication, and began to write on social movements. And if it hadn't been for social movements, and if it hadn't been for issues management, I would never have become interested in public relations. Because I think that really the big theme in all of this is issues and how people address issues as a part of creating communities of shared interest, shared relationship, and some sense of shared future. Uh, and into that regard, we communicate. So I'm very much a constitutivist that we really create organizations through communicate, communication. And so it's more that we communicate to organize rather than we organize to communicate. So I place a greater emphasis upon communication aspect as something that is shared by the people in a society or a community or a culture, if you would, rather than something that is uniquely owned by an organization. 
But even then, in the beginning, we often tend to focus on the origins associated with organizations communicating to people. And in many instances, those organizations were governmental organizations. I just got a new handbook. This is volume 27 of the handbook. It's Handbooks of Communication Science. This one on public relations. And as I began to thumb it, it's the only handbook that I've ever seen that begins with a chapter really on history. And Tom Watson at the very beginning says, well, it began in maybe in, um, let's see, Samaria, was that what he identified here? We have people that will say that it began in Byzantium in modern Iraq. Uh, some people will say Syria, often where the government communicated with citizens the Code of Hammurabi, some of you have heard about that. Uh, a ruler one time said, well, if people are going to be uh, held accountable for living within the law, they ought to know what the law is. Now, that's pretty enlightened. I mean, you know, that is so strangely enlightened that you say to yourself, well, it took us several hundred thousand years of human existence to realize that people can only be held accountable for violating a law if they know what the law is. I mean, that's a major step forward. So there we go. Some people have said it's the reporting on agricultural processes. I've often said it's two people or two leaders of two bands standing on each side of a river. And before they met one another, they decided how many feathers they should wear in their hair or what amount of mud they should paint themselves with before they did that so that they would look either very friendly or very ferocious because I've always believed that those are really the two polar concepts in public relations, either to be very ferocious or to be very friendly. Now, the friendly part is our whole rationale for, for, um, for uh, relationship management, but the ferocious part is our whole rationale for being an activist. So it doesn't surprise me that eventually somewhere along the line, somebody would say, well, the American Revolution was clearly one of the first moments of public relations. And Cutliffe is one of the ones that says that. Well, along the way, right? We've had fairs for a very long time. I know very little about Chinese culture. I have a good friend and write with him often who is Korean. And he's convinced that Korea and China and Japan were really the origins. And the reason that we identify Samaria is because we tend to be more interested in the United States and in Europe in the Middle East than we are in the Far East. But as old as the organized cultures of China and Korea and so forth are, undoubtedly they were doing all kinds of communication from organizations typically those organizations being government in various ways, even if they're emperors. I've had the luxury of going to Taiwan and looking at the wonderful artifacts that are in Taiwan because they were stolen from what was then called the People's Republic of China by the people who created Taiwan as a, as a quasi freestanding country. And the great artifacts, some of which took 50 years to make are there, and they were made in honor of the emperor. And so the emperor got all of these wonderful artifacts, these carvings out of jade and adorned the palace and used those around to say what an enormously powerful and wonderful individual the person was. And you say, is that much different than corporate America where they have wonderful buildings, they have gorgeous uh, uh, campuses. I one time went on the uh, campus of uh, Exxon Mobil and they have 500 acres and they have security there. They say that not a grasshopper moves on that campus, that there's security. I mean, it's like a country in and of itself is that much different than some ancient emperor in China. So all of these organizations of one kind or another set about saying who they were, defining defining the community, defining what people did and what people shouldn't do, 
what they were obligated to do, what they could be rewarded for, what they could be punished for. We also then get into, in the history of all of this monarchy, the business of marriages. And I'm reading a book on the English monarchs again by Antonia Frazier, and all of this business of, well, we tried to create a uh, alliance with so-and-so and it fell through and then they rebelled against the alliance and then somebody uh, had a betrothal and that didn't work out and somebody died in the middle of, of a marriage and that didn't work out. And so all of this kind of stuff, all of this, I think one way or another has something to do about public relations. It's really the organizational efforts of people to build communities that are relatively sustainable. And I heard a couple of you talk about that as your, your model. And I think that's really what it is. Whether you're a company, you want to stay in business, you want to sell products, you want to uh, attract um, resources to you, you want to mitigate or to engage in responsible regulation, litigation, so that your business processes can be orderly and as efficient and as uh, profitable as possible. So all of this to me is where we focus on what is the history of public relations. One of the problems that we've had in public relations is that we've had all sorts of scholars say, well, if any of this sounds anything like anything other than two-way symmetrical, it couldn't possibly be public relations. It has to be something else. And therefore, when you have Caesar returning, showing off all of what Caesar has stolen from some other country, Caesar is bringing in all of these slaves to show amazing you know, capability as a general. I'm sure that that was public relations when they built the arena and they killed animals and people for the celebration of the wonderfulness of Rome. That was public relations. So there's been some awful terrible things that have gone on, but by the same token, over the years, a lot of good things have happened. I had a good friend, uh, fairly iconic in the United States, Ralph Freedy is his name. He was one of the co-founders of the Public Relations Review. And he raised $2 billion when $2 billion was a lot of money for Methodist Hospital. And you can do that in Houston because Houston is a town of very, very wealthy people. But the benefit of his fundraising, so his fundraising, public relations, is when we send off people in our colonies to help uh, sustain our military by getting the French to spend so much money on us that they end up having to overtax their people and they end up suffering a revolution. Uh, is that what public relations is all about? So to me, it's really quite a tangle, but it all has to do with organizations communicating. People are what make organizations work. People use organizations to make themselves more effective. And part of the, what they use to make themselves more effective is communication. Uh, in her definition of public relations, Chera Valentini, some of you've heard of her and some of you should have heard her if you haven't, talked about public relations as being essentially a social influence. Well, that's a nice term. I know that uh, Coombs likes the word influence. And she defines it as a specialized communication function in charge of building, supporting, and maintaining positive images, as well as respectful and constructive relations with publics and stakeholders through communication and non-communication activities. I think that's broad enough to account for everything that we want to put under that hat of what is communication, what is public relations, what is organizational communication. It's really the way that organizations become known to themselves. Um, I'm also one of those curious people that try to find stuff that other people would consider not to be public relations. And I think that it is. I've got a very good friend in Barcelona. Some of you should know him if you don't, and his name is Jordi Schifra. Uh, for those of you that are uh, problematic with the Spanish language, Schifra is actually spelled starting with an X, X-I-F-R-A, is uh, 
Jordy's spelling of his last name. Uh, he and I developed uh, over adult beverages a fond conversation about Guenica. That's how he tells me I should pronounce it, the town in northern Spain that uh, Hitler and Franco decided to practice bombing raids on. And an artist who just happened to be off to the World's Fair in Paris, he had left Spain because he couldn't tolerate Spain anymore. His name was Picasso. Some of you may have heard of him. Couldn't think of anything to do a painting on until he heard about the atrocity of the bombing of the city of uh, Guernica. And so he painted the great mural, which was dedicated to that bombing. And Jordi and I have argued that that is a great moment of publicity. And I even use Kirk Hallahan, who is a name that you ought to know, who is working on the history of, of uh, the Colorado coal strike as a moment in crisis communication, public relations, Colorado in the United States. And uh, publicity is to make known. So a lot of public relations is merely making known. Now, some people would say, well, making known about a product, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to be in marketing, but making known about atrocities because we know that atrocities need to be called to people's attention. And I suspect that that's one of the arguments that Cutlip would make for the the uh, role of public relations in the American Revolution. We like to point to all the atrocities that England had committed against us. And we could do that because we had a lot of land and we, had, we were hard to get to. Uh, and there were a lot of us and we could just kind of hide and run away from their big armies. And we did for a while. And they finally spent so much money that we weren't worth it any longer. And, and so forth. Well, anyway, I wander around a lot, just amusing myself by how we try to figure out what that one moment was that was public relations. And it's really just so much a part of the human spirit as it is an organized effort through communication and communication as broadly as we can, can uh, make it here, communication to create culture, to create society, to create community, which is an orderly way of living together, even though if we are in opposition to some, with somebody else to do that. So if we were to jump through all of that and jump over the, uh, uh, the American Revolution and say, well, when did we really get serious about public relations? We have to turn at least to America United States and in the, the uh, 19th century, the 1800s, uh, people have often pointed to uh, the circuses, the traveling shows, the Chautauquas, speaking circuits and so forth, but they also talk about railroads. The United States, for those of you that have never been here, is actually a pretty big place. We're about the same size as Australia, we just have more people, <laughs> most of which we took away from somebody. But nevertheless, we needed, among other things, to get a railroad system across the country. So right in the middle of a civil war, which is one of the great public relations crises of the US government, we decided to keep building a railroad system so that we can connect ourselves to the West Coast, the East and the West, well, once we do that, then we've got to pay for all of that. And so we gave the railroad companies a lot of land because the federal government owned all the land, ostensibly. And so the railroads could sell the land. Well, then they had to go out and convince somebody to move from Sweden or Norway or Germany or England or Ireland or other parts of Europe primarily. But then we also had people come to the United States from China. And the Chinese built a fair amount of railroad in the United States, particularly through the Sierra Nevadas and the Sierra Madres. Well, all of that had to be financed, all of that had to be sold, all of that. So many people have said that the great moment in public relations in the United States 
was the advent of communication on behalf of the railroads. It required legislation, governmental relations, community relations, all of the functions that we so readily associate with what public relations is. So one of the things that I find very interesting is that we then almost necessarily began to associate public relations with industrialization. And some of the great iconic moments, and these are truly the moments that have changed the world forever. One of them was the battle between Westinghouse, who believed that alternating current was best, and Thomas Edison, who believed that direct current was best, and they battled at, out in what was called the Battle of the Currents. There's actually a movie about that, and there are all kinds of documentaries. Tesla was a part of that, the great inventor, who was on Westinghouse's side. And it got to the point where, to demonstrate how terrible alternating current was, Edison convinced states, most particularly the state of New York, to begin to kill things, animals, horses, even an elephant, and finally human beings. So the whole practice of electrocuting people to death in the United States grew out of the argument by Edison that alternating current, which was far more efficient and sustainable and energy efficient, was deadly. And you say to yourself, well, that's amazing. Well, jump ahead a number of years, and I came out of graduate school, stumbled around, wrote about social movement activism, found out about issues management, and I said, oh, issues management. And by that time, and this is now the, the 1970s in the United States, issues management got its name. And in, and in deference to Tony, I will say that sometimes people only put it, they put no S after issue management, I do, but be it as it may, there was a lot of interest in that as a discipline. And that appealed to me because I believed in rhetoric, I believed in argumentation. I believe that society can only exist to the extent that we can resolve our differences by contesting and managing issues. And therein lies what I thought was pretty good, was I wrote about that in terms of the, of the era of the 60s in the United States, when we were arguing about everything, including war, nuclear energy, international peace, women's rights, civil rights, rights of African-Americans, rights of Hispanics, environmental rights, all of these rights we were, being arguing, we were arguing about, I realized that almost all of that, if you flip it back, was exactly what was going on in the 1880s in the United States. So I've argued that issues management was 100 years old before we rediscovered it or discovered it for the first time. And so my argument is that really all of public relations, all of the real heavy lifting, all of the stuff that really changes society is issues management, is public relations. And it has to do with how will we create our industries? How will we produce resources? How will we translate resources into saleable products? How will we negotiate with labor? How will labor negotiate with industry, because the great era of labor management relationships grew out of the era of the robber barons and the people like uh, John D. Rockefeller and uh, Edison and Westinghouse and all of the people whose names became associated with the industry in the United States. Now, what's really interesting as well, we had a group of people decide that we ought to have a public information campaign during the First World War when we finally decided that it was something that the United States should get into. And that to do that, we should raise money from the citizens by selling bonds. And so a group of people got together, they put together a committee, 
the Creel Committee and many people who eventually became notorious or, or, or famous in public relations grew out of what were called the Four Minute Men. And they wrote speeches and they delivered speeches to sell bonds and to get people to sign up and become supporters of the uh, American intervention in the First World War. What was interesting is that out of that grew the notion of propaganda. Now, propaganda was by no means new because that goes back to the Catholic Church uh, about uh, 700 years before the time that it became associated with government communication in the United States. The propagatio, that was a way in which the priests largely were trained to propagate the faith. So the whole notion of preaching and propagating the faith was seen as something similar to what public relations was. And of course, the Catholic Church got very, very good at that, built enormous churches, created enormous amount of wealth, got into battles with kings like Henry VIII, and out of that came the Reformation, which was a counter movement against the uh, the Catholic Church, and then out of that grew all, all of these Protestant sects, which largely defined religion in the United States, uh, which is very typical of the United States. Everybody could just go down the road six miles, start them a church, and that's all that you needed to do was to get people to show up on Sunday and bring in maybe a couple of chickens that to pay the preacher for that week or invite the preacher over for a meal on Sunday and things were working pretty well. Well, anyway, propaganda. And propaganda began to be associated with public relations because people, particularly Bernays, who was the double nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he was interested in psychology. Freud was, but so was uh, Bernays. Eventually, Bernays comes to make the argument that he can engineer consent. That was a very important and, and, and very difficult moment in the history of public relations, because there were many people who did not agree with Bernays. One of them was a little guy that had started a firm with a friend. The friend's name is uh, Knowlton, and the, the, the guy that started the firm was John Hill. John Hill was a newspaper man from Kansas who believed that journalists were actually rhetoricians. Now, John Hill never used that word, but he believed that journalists did what they did because they provided information to people and they helped people to make good decisions. Well, the woman that was the director of my dissertation, Marie Nichols, defined rhetoric as the art of the enlightened choice. It is quite likely that she would have had very, very interesting conversations with John Hill John Hill, who created, in my mind, the greatest public relations firm of the time and perhaps of all times, did not believe in, in uh, marketing, although his firm made a lot of money for marketing. Uh, I had the opportunity to read his letters, papers, and so forth at the University of Wisconsin, and they were put up there by Cutlip, who was probably in, in, of himself both our greatest archivist and our worst historian in the United States. Cutler is a terrible historian, but he had some very, very bright students. But Cutler had the ability to get all of the people that were anybody to provide the papers out of their careers for the archives at the University of Wisconsin. So that's where I learned about John Hill. And what got me interested in John Hill was I was being paid to sort of rescue Hill and Knowlton from a RICO charge, conspiracy to commit crime uh, in cahoots with the tobacco industry, which was alleged by many people to be systematically, willfully, and wantingly killing people in the name of profit. So I go up there and I read all of these papers. And one of the things that I find out is that, that uh, our friend Bernays, who had a firm that had about eight people in it at its heyday, 
kept sending letters to John Hill asking him if he would like to have Hill come over and help him to run his firm. At that time, Hill had 285 employees. Now you might jump to the fact, my, that's a lot of public relations people, but keep in mind in those days, half of every firm was women. And women in those days in a public relations firm were secretaries. That's a very important part of the history of public relations because now we have women playing an increasingly important role in the history of public relations in the United States. And in those days, they were all women. Of all the papers that I ever read, all the letters, all the correspondence, none of them were by women in all of the Hill's papers. And Hill retired in about 68, which is about the time that he quit the tobacco industry because he realized that the tobacco industry had lost the issue that the federal government and other researchers had convinced government that cigarette smoking was bad for your health. Well, the point I'm making is that we had lots of different streams of what public relations is. It was largely there to represent corporate interests, but those were not corporate interests that were indifferent to the role of management in communities. And I think everybody ought to read as much of John Hill's work as they can. It's hard to get his books and that's unfortunate, although every once in a while, one of them goes back on the market. But his argument was that you can't do anything in management that exceeds public trust. And that is exactly the argument in issues management in the legitimacy gap. If you get to the point that you are seen as illegitimate for what you want to do as a company, you simply have to change. You can't, you can't run against the tide of regulation, litigation, and legislation. Well, that to me is really the heart and soul of modern 20th century public relations. And I would say that relationships are important and image is important, but ultimately it's really down to the point of what are the choices that we have to make as a society? Now, a number of other people along the same time as uh, Bernays were coming along, Ivy Lee was one of them. When I was in Melbourne, I was, uh, as I recall, uh, went to dinner with a person who was one of the last people of the uh, Ivy Lee agency, because one of the things that happened was that all of the big New York agencies spread around the world and then began to retract when they found out, or the locals found out, that they could do a lot better if they didn't have to send a lot of money to New York. And so that whole notion of New York teaching everybody how to run public relations had begun to really severely fizzle out over the last number of years. That doesn't diminish the influence of New York. It just suggests that once you teach people something, they can do it very well themselves. But one of the other points that I wanna make with John Hill was that he said, we have to avoid any effort to associate ourselves with propaganda, even though propaganda was very influential in what people thought was effective communication in the early part of the 20th century. Bob, and it was because like to him, Truth was the important thing, yes. Mitchell Hobbs wanted to jump in with a question. Okay. Sorry to inter interrupt your um, momentum there, Bob, but I, I find John Hill a very uh, interesting figure. I, I did a little bit of work on the tobacco lobby and I'm, I'm not sure if you've read Merchants of Doubt that came out about 10 I years have. ago, but I yeah. And, and, and so I, I, they make the accusation that sort of Hill was sort of um, uh, fundamental in persuading American tobacco to, to use doubt as their strategy, their rhetorical strategy. And then that was then picked up by the fossil fuel lobby and, and they sort of lay the blame on Blob for sort of stalling action on climate change as well as... Uh, and it was because of that that then the anti-tobacco people uh, see Hill and Norton in conspiracy, a RICO case, which in our country was designed so that the mob could be brought to justice that you didn't have to knowingly tell somebody to go out and whack somebody just merely thinking that it was a good idea uh, was sufficient. Uh, and that was exactly the reason that I got into this. And I, I could go on and on and on and on and on and well beyond what you and I would want to. But the 
the, the simple argument that, that would be made is that Hill and Milton was invited to meet with the Tobacco Institute people. They're, they weren't called the Tobacco Institute people at the time. All of them had headquarters in New York City, and so they were coming and going back and forth. And I've read the organization papers, and Hill and, Hill and one of his number two guys, it wasn't Nolan, Nolan actually stayed in Cleveland. He never went to New York and Hill ran the agency in New York. They met with the tobacco people and they swore the tobacco people that their science necessarily said that there was no harm in smoking tobacco. And the documents are that is exactly the contractual relationship. And so what Hill said was then what you do is that you fund research and he set up the organization by which that research would be funded. And you hire people to do funded research to investigate whether tobacco is or is not a health hazard. And some of the people in that group actually believed that it was smog. And particularly one researcher who was a university researcher at LC, uh, UCLA argued that he was getting funding from that institute to argue that smog was the killer. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that Hill would have agreed that doubt was what he was selling, but I would say that Hill would believe what is the enlightened decision that we have to make. Now, we, we could argue that I'm playing you know, a jargon game with you in saying that, and I, and I wouldn't say, well, I can understand why the case would be made. I really do like to believe that Hill was a man of great integrity, and I could not find, no matter how hard I worked, and I was being paid a handsome amount of money to find it, I could not find any document that ended why the Hill and Knowlton Agency said, we no longer can represent the tobacco industry, but my intuition was that they came to the conclusion that the evidence was so compelling that once the federal government ruled the attorney, I mean, the Surgeon General ruled that it was health hazard, that the industry had lost the issue and there was nothing that could be done to save it. And some of the Hill and Knowlton people actually left the firm and created a separate firm to continue to represent the tobacco industry. So that is a terrific case. The irony of it is that I tried once to write, and I actually gave a presentation on this at, at, the, at the Melbourne conference, I mean, at the uh, Burnmouth conference, and I was met with such enormous hostility that I said, I simply will go to my grave before I write anything comprehensive about this and put these documents into place. And you are absolutely right in saying that there are critics out there and critics really do hold Hill responsible for that. I think a case can be made that he was a better guy than, than was often given credit for, but it is one of those great moments where public relations was very, very, very much on the line. And the question is, does public relations serve society or not serve society, and that is exactly the, the case study that I take away from that controversy. I think it's a wonderful controversy to study in that particular way. Thank you, I would love to see you write uh, about it. <laughs> well, well uh, Tony wanted to jump in with a question when you're done there too. Okay. Bob, um, every few years without fail, somebody says, we've got to stop calling it public relations and call it something else. And I know that the PRSA spent a vast amount of time and resources thinking about changing the name and in the end said, this is too damn difficult. What's your view about the term public relations and is there really any good reason why it should change? Well, you, you, you bring up a part of the theme that I wanted to, to dwell on, and that is that the early part of the 19th century, maybe the, the, I mean, the 20th century, the, early, the latter part of the 19th century, uh, 
we really began to have people emerge as public relations people and put out a shingle to that effect. And Ivy Lee was one of the first, um, there are others in corporations and so forth. And it looked to them at the time like it was a pretty good term to use because it talked about this whole notion of representing an organization effectively to something called the public. And then we got into an argument about whether there's one public or many publics or their publics can be segmented, et cetera, et cetera. We go down that line. But one of the things that I find interesting in that whole scheme of things is that I think the issues management people actually put a lot of pressure on the public relations people because the issues management people, your friend Chase, who was actually very, very fond of John Hill, and I've argued persuasively to myself and to a lot of people that read an article in the Journal of Public Affairs, that John Hill is actually the father of the American version of issues management because of just what I was talking about. He loved issues. He loved a good battle. He thought that that was the essence of good journalism. He saw it as journalism. We wouldn't have seen, seen it that way today because journalists don't, don't see themselves as, as brokers of truth as much as, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what journalists do and then commentators do something else and it, it gets all to be very complicated. But back to your question, I think that the issues management people began to say there's an alternative term. And then what happened is that as public relations researchers began to move away from public, I mean, from marketing, publicity and promotion, then it began to lose its connection to marketing, which is where a lot of its money came from. And a lot of the reason why companies hired public relations people. And in the oil and gas industry, my experience was that the public affairs people, there were corporate communications people, actually hired the advertising people. And in Coca-Cola, it was the advertising people that hired public relations people. So it was sort of like, what is your paradigm? Is your advertising paradigm or do you have a public relations relationship building uh, issue management kind of thing? Um, but the people that have put the greatest pressure on public relations are the strategic communications people. And people like Kirk Hallahan, when he wrote that article in which began the Journal of, of Strategic Communication, which I reviewed that journal, I said, I can't imagine the concept of strategic communication existing, even though I knew that Glenn Cameron was very much pushing it up there at uh, uh, Missouri. But what, what uh, Hallahan's argument is, is that so much of the scholarship of public relations has drifted away from what public relations does mostly, like fundraising, like employee communication, like government relations, and all of the many complexities of it, and that it's lost its currency in the mind of Hallahan to strategic communication. So that now the strategic communication people even see public relations as one of the functions of strategic communication. I just say to myself, well, you call me what you want based upon what you pay me to do it. <laughs> uh, so, so what do you think, Tony? <laughs> I think that it's a term which we simply can't get away from, even though it has a whole lot of negative connotations. Yeah. I think finding an alternative is just too damn difficult. And so and, I believe we're going to stick with it for a long, long time. And we've had so many of the people in cultural uh, studies now talk about critical public relations as though they've been able to sanitize public relations by simply calling it critical public relations, right? Well, I call that activism or something else. <laughs> so we go round and round and round in these circles. Uh, I was at a conference in uh, uh, Edinburgh one time and somebody was talking about how much money gets paid to people through agencies in the United States. I said, that's one reason why it's hard to change away from public relations in the United States because you can make so much money by putting that on your business card. <laughs> Bob, Shima wanted to ask a question. Sure. My question is also about terminology. 
uh, why we exclude public relations to organizations. Um, for example, when you define public relations at the beginning, while artists or public inte intellectuals uh, also use it. Well, I throw in Picasso, of course, right? But Picasso was actually doing that on behalf of an organization. He was doing that on behalf of Spain as he wanted it to do it. He wasn't working necessarily for them, although he was a little bit. He and Miro both had a stipend to do a artwork for Spain in the World Fair. So he was kind of working for Spain, but he, he loved Spain. And as I recall, Picasso never returned to Spain in the rest of his life. And I don't remember whether he outlived Franco or Franco outlived him. If he did, he never went back while Franco was still alive. Uh, usually what happens that even if you have activists, and I'm very much for activism as a part of what is in, important in public relations, sooner or later you have an organization and I recently published a piece in Public Relations Review where I talk about the Parkland students taking on the NRA. And so you've got a bunch of kids and they're loosely considered as an organization. But I think that as uh, the Parkland students, they have a greater agency than if it's just three or four kids. So I think there is that notion to gravitate and I belong to probably almost every environmental group that was ever created. And even remember when, uh, it, it, you know, to be a, involved in an, our environmental group, graduate students at major doctoral programs were their primary uh, target because we could do a mimeograph. <laughs> so they could come to us and we could mimeograph the flyers that they would hand out the anti-war students, the same thing so that they could stand out on the street corner and hand out anti-war mimeograph pieces of paper. We didn't have access to Xerox back in those days, so it was all on mimeograph. Uh, but the notion of individuals, uh, you know, they stand out, but almost invariably there's somebody else with them. You, you simply say, for instance, well, what about somebody like Martin Luther King? Well, there's an organization. Uh, all of the environments, uh, Greta Thunberg. My argument, and I've, and I've made this pretty strong, one of the important parts of issues management is to mobilize people in support of your cause. So I think organization is very much a part of the, the ability to bring pressure for or against your cause. Yeah. And sometimes, for example, I follow some artists on Instagram and I can see that they express their um, personal views around an issue uh, and they have a high social influence over their audiences. Can we also um, consider that as public relations? It can be. A lot of times what happens is that artists get co-opted by activist groups. Uh, that there's an activist uh, artist out there and all of a sudden that becomes the darling of the of the activist group and so and to some extent that's what happened to Picasso I think Picasso became more associated with the the Republican cause in Spain than his communism would have allowed and that gets to be very 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 complicated because he was an avowed communist as a matter of fact, he used to trade paintings for food and for suits and clothes and so forth. Now that's, <laughs> that's pretty good, right? Everybody would want to be Picasso's tailor. <laughs> I just got a Picasso by, by selling him a set of trousers. Uh, anyway, I, I just find all of this to be great fun, uh, just wonderful fun. But somehow, somewhere along the line, now you get into something else that to me is very, very complicated. And I leave it to you young people to figure that out is the role of social media and how in the world social media works. Uh, and I say that because I think if we look at ourselves in the United States today, the ability of social media to give voice to people who should not get voice 
is enormously risky to a democracy. And if you don't believe that, you haven't paid nearly enough attention to what's happened in the last five years or six years in the United States. I mean, we have come as close to the loss of a democracy as we could have. And now we've got, you know, people in our own US Congress saying, well, it was just a bunch of people on an outing who only got angry when the police told them they couldn't go inside. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on in social media. There's a lot of hate speech in social media. And that's one of the things that we lose when we lose the role of media relations as a instrumental and constructive part of social, or I mean, of, of public relations, uh, where we have battles between newspapers as to what the truth was. One of the things that was interesting, back to the, uh, the question that Mitchell put out, one of the things that I did as a part of studying the influence of of uh, John Hill, uh, some of the public relations people that were writing about and also doing the litigation work uh, for the tobacco or against the tobacco industry would wave around all of the press releases that John Hill would create for this institute, which became the Tobacco Institute. And I had to tell the attorneys that I was working with that you have to be in public relations to realize how many press releases never make their way into print. And so he said, well, you prove that. So I've selected 10 major newspapers and looked at all of the press releases and then a bunch more that were being touted as being distortive to the message. And one of the things that I found was that many of them were never covered. Uh, many of them also actually ended up being the middle paragraph in a news story. If the news story was 12 paragraphs long, the first six paragraphs were the anti-tobacco, two paragraphs devoted to Hill, one of them devoted to the organization of the organization, one was the statement on that issue, and then the last uh, paragraphs were again, the criticism of the tobacco industry. And so what I was able to point out was that even the great Hill and Knowlton couldn't win the battle in, in newspapers because the newspapers were getting their information from other people and the tobacco industry was just lying so badly and the researchers were doing such interesting research that the, that the greatest, in my mind, the greatest public relations firm in the world couldn't even get more than two paragraphs out of any news story out of a press release. So I think that's very important to realize the dialogic, you know, I'm using Kenton Taylor here, right? The dialogic nature of the news. When the news seeks to be, ceases to be dialogic and, and we have media that are off by themselves talking only to themselves, we, we don't have a very healthy media environment. And that's one of the things that I think can happen with, with social media. I, yes. Uh, maybe you know Paul Holmes, the British author who, who has this founder of the Holmes Report. He once Only he... Reputation. Huh, sorry? Only by reputation. Uh. Yeah. So and yeah, and he uh, once he said he was in, he he made a public lecture in, here in Kiev, and he said he he said uh, something like take take public relations out of schools of journalism. Yeah. You know, uh, you 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 in, in your lecture today you you mentioned a lot of pioneers of public relations and and almost all of them were former journalists. Yeah, they had a journalism That's background. Right. Well, you're exactly right. Yeah, and and I, for example, I, I came to public relations from, from journalism. I was trained as a journalist, I work as a journalist. But now but but now maybe maybe from my perspective, because I'm I'm not in the center of this like uh 
how to say, because all innovations in communication are, 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 are how to say, are appearing in in United States, in Western Europe, not not definitely not in our country. So maybe I I I don't know exactly what's going on, but my my understanding is that there is a kind of uh, some some kind of um, like uh, like religious wars be, be, between uh, communication departments of different universities some 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 of them are still on this media and communications angle and and some of them are starting to do something other i i i, I don't want to say the word new because new has a connotation this is must be better but uh, i I uh, maybe you can how say tell me something about it because I'm I'm You're really absolutely curious. Absolutely right. Uh, yeah. The worst battles, the most unproductive battles that I ever engaged in in my life, were with mm -hmm. the journalists at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. All of them would have just been happy if I had never existed. Mm -hmm. When I got interested in public relations, they had a guy who went to sleep in his lectures, an old journalism teacher who taught public relations and did so in such a boring way that he literally would just drift off and then the students would get up and walk out of the class. And so I say, well, there's something else that's really interesting. And of course, to me, it was all about issues management. And that's what I began to write about and, and did almost all of my writing about that before I ever seriously wrote about public relations, or I had to write about issues management within public relations uh, because public relations would give credence to issues management where I thought it was really the other way around. This all goes back to the late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, and then I began at one a period to begin to teach more of the public relations students, but uh, I had a course on called rhetorical and critical approaches to public relations. And the first paper I had them write was what is public relations. So every once in a while they would send over one of their 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 news kids to be in my class. And so one of the students in there, one of the young journalists wrote in, in that that essay, that public relations is the work of the devil. <laughs> and so everybody had to read and defend their paper. And so he got up and he was full of himself, the work of the devil. And after the four or five really bright young women, and, and it was always the young women, it was never the guys. And I hate to say this, but I came so, so disenamored of so many guys in, the study of communication because the women were almost invariably the more interesting ones. Uh, they turned on him and said, look at all the things that public relations does. And then they began to enumerate, you know, down the line and they would, and, and, and in this day and age, they would have said, and look at little Greta Thunberg. She's just a child coming out of Sweden. And because of her ability to do public relations, she's now created an entire world movement. And, and you know, for all of this righteousness, and what are you people writing about in journalism on, on climate change? And he just could not handle it. So I really do think that the name of the discipline isn't as important as the mission of the discipline. And that's why I like John Hill who believed that we have to figure out how to enlighten a society, how to create a, an informed society and it's a society that constructively makes decisions together. And I would even include in that marketing communication because I think a lot of times marketing communication sells people products that they should not eat, they should not drink because it's not good for their health. They shouldn't smoke cigarettes, right? <laughs> so we have to have that side of the equation, but we have to battle it out. And that's why I think I take this notion of the fully functioning society. And one of you had a variation of that, because I think that the essence of public relations is an ability to help society to be fully functioning, good place to work, good place to live. Other questions? <clears throat> 
Hiroshima. Can I, can I ask a question? Oh, um, absolutely. In fully functioning society, you, um, you um, refer to the development of shared meaning among different groups in society who argue against each other in order to come to a common ground. Yeah. Now, my question is, what about um, radical activists who are subversive and they are not interested in negotiation? Um, for example, here, here in Australia, some um, environmental activist groups who are working um, towards climate justice they say, uh, abolish um, the police, abolish uh, fossil fuel companies, or even some more radical activists say, who, are, who have socialist point of views, they say, abolish the governments. So they, they, they are not interested in negotiation, negotiation with the government or fossil fuel companies or the police. They, just, they would just like it to be abolished. You are much younger than I am, but I will wager, and I'm almost 80, I, I will wager that none of them will be successful in my lifetime, let alone in your lifetime. I think the whole problem of radical activism is you can get too far away from the center, and you can ask people to be something too dramatically different from what is that which makes them able to do what they do as individuals. And that means that you get them too far away from being able to have transportation, get them away from being able to heat their homes. Uh, you know, Greta Thunberg comes to the United States and she takes a sailboat. Okay, that's wonderful. But can we have a world economy where we only use sailboats? I mean, we one time, had an economy where we only use sailboats. Can we figure out a way to have our cake and eat it too? That's an American expression. And I think that's always the challenge to the radical. So what I see as the radical is that the radical will nibble around at the edges, but what they're trying to do is to attract people to them. And that goes back to the notion I have in, in my sense of issues management that you've got to mobilize your effort, which means that you've got to bring people to you. Uh, one of the most influential radicals in, in my lifetime was a guy by the name of Saul Alinsky. Uh, Saul Alinsky was a guy who was incredibly clever. Uh, he figured out all kinds of ways to bring uh, change. And his argument was that you can never bring about change if you ask people to get out of their comfort zone. So what he was trying to do in work with, in, co in coalition with uh, labor unions in Chicago was to increase the salaries and, and the hiring of, of African-Americans at O'Hare Field in Chicago. Now, if you are trying to get the airfield of uh, Chicago to pay attention to you, what do you do? Where is your weakness? And what he got people to do was to go and in the men's room is, is the, the, the real challenge. The women's room, as you all know, there's never enough stalls in the women's room in an airport anyway. <laughs> so there's always a line, but you have to create a line in the men's room. And so the activists would go and stand in front of the urinals and take their time. And so all of these people have come off of an airplane having had three cups of coffee or four beers, and they now start down the corridors looking for the first available men's room. And they're all taken by these activists who are standing, relieving themselves patiently, slowly at the urinal with seven of their allies behind them. <laughs> and more where they came from. And finally they said, okay, let's talk. And that was one of the things that was good about him was that he could figure out the way that even if you did something that seemed to be terribly unpopular, what can you do, which is the weakness of your opposition? 
there were subdivisions in the United States that would not integrate you know, African-American homeowners. And so Saul Alinsky said, well, what you do is you go and you rent space or you have you, uh, places on the, the street at the entrance to a subdivision and you hold watermelon parties. Now in the United States, watermelon eating is one of the great metaphors of being African-American. As a matter of fact, it's both something that they enjoy doing, but it's also a terrible slur. But if you're trying to sell property and you've got black people standing around or sitting around at the entrance to your subdivision eating watermelon, white people are not going to show up in that subdivision. So what do you do? And I think sometimes that, that radical activists don't understand where their leverage is and they believe that anger is the only thing that they can use on their side and extremity is the only thing that they can use on their side. Um, and, and, and that's probably that's probably a dysfunction. One of the things that I find it, and, and this brings us back to the United States is that the opponents to change are now madder than they've ever been before. And that's why we are at a very, very difficult spot in, in our country right now, because we can't talk to one another. And that's what happens with the radicals. They give people an incentive not to talk to them. So you have to figure out a way and this is, I think, the art of activism. Figure out a way to get people to talk to you so that you can begin to move. You know, and in a sense, that's what Bernie has done. Bernie's done it for 40 years now, and he's made progress. Uh, but Bernie will never live to see all of Bernie's ideas put into play, though. Societies change very slowly almost invariably. If they change too quickly, go back and ask the French Revolution what that one was like. <laughs> what the French Revolution did was change so quickly they brought about Napoleon, which was probably worse than what they had before. Tony? Bob, there's another point about activists, and I think in that often the radical activists forget that you need to be very single-minded. And I think about two very successful movements at the moment, the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement have grown enormously because they're very single-minded. Whereas the so-called um, Occupy movement, which nobody knew what they were about, uh, it, it picked up lots and lots of different causes and ultimately faded away because um, nobody really knew what it was the movement was about. So I think that one of the elements of being successful activist is to have a really, really clear, singular objective. That's right. And, and tied to an issue that is resolvable and discussable. Yeah. I worry that our Erica is beginning to get very cold there. Are you? <laughs> The temperature is dropping. <laughs> Pulling the sleeves of your sweater down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting chilly in Colombia. <laughs> Bob, if you don't mind me asking a follow-up question. Um, oh, I and, and I just, I dropped a, a more sort of detailed version in the chat, but I'm just sort of curious about your theory of the fully functioning society and how, <clears throat> uh, you know, is it uh, being undermined, I suppose, by you know, cancel culture and the emergence of these echo chambers on social media that seems to be sort of polarizing us and, and moving us more to models of dissensus rather than consensus and co-creational oh. meanings. Compromise seems hard to find at the moment on so many issues. The way that that article came about, and I tried to revise it once, and Coombs had a, a, a some journal that he, I mean, some handbook that he was doing and it fell through and I forget what it was. And I might or might not write a, a, a new version of that. Uh, but I was very much influenced by the communitarians, going clear back to uh, uh, Krukeberg and uh, 
and his uh, buddy at Iowa, I can't remember his name right now, Kukaberg and da, 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 da. anyway. But I got very much wrapped up in that. And then there were a couple up in Missouri that were into the communitarian ideas. And the man that I did my doctoral dissertation on, Kenneth Burke was a communitarian. Uh, he was actually a communist, but uh, <laughs> he, he was a, a communitarian. He believes that how we share substance and it is the sharing of substance and community and so forth. So what I did was I wanted to talk about community and I was invited by uh, Elizabeth Toth who was putting together the grand tour of four people who were retiring. I was retiring and I stayed on much longer than, than my retirement party. Uh, Grunig was retiring, Jim Grunig was retiring, uh, Lori Grunig was tiring and retiring and um, uh, Glenn Broom was retiring. So all four of us were supposed to give these presentations and we were going to give them at ICA, SCA and AJMC which we did. And so I was becoming so confused that a single organization and a single relationship, and particularly one that was mutually beneficial with such a narrow and this limiting uh, view of public relations that I wanted to broaden it. And so what I did was to you know, call on Kruckerberg and uh, his colleague and, uh, and uh, Hallahan and uh, that whole communitarian movement to say that's really what it's all about is you know creating a community of shared interests, shared will, shared you know uh, values. Uh, and I've had other people say, well, tell me what a fully functioning society is. And my argument is it is what the people of that society say it is when it feels good. Then along the way, I played another trick in that. And that is that if public relations in its evil sense is bending the community to serve the, the, the corporation or the corporate interest, which some people argue that it is, including selling them cigarettes, then if you turn that around, a more positive public relations is to get the, the corporate interest to serve the community interest. Now, the clever connection there is that the license to operate always originates out of the community. Communities can put natural citizens to death, but communities can also put artificial citizens to death. They can legalize them, they can make them not legal. And therein lies the whole rubric of of regulation, legislation, litigation, and so forth, and legitimacy and agency. And so all of these kinds of terms I see as collective terms, but we have to be very careful in the United States that we use the word collective. People you know, immediately assume that we're all a bunch of terrible lefties. And one of the things that I've done in the last few days is we out here in the country, and some of you have heard about ERCOT, which is the energy reliance uh, group here in Texas that is supposed to make sure that we all have affordable electricity and people got bills for their electricity for a few days of 16,000, 17, $18,000. That's for three or four days of electricity. That's called the free enterprise system as mastermind by government and the, the deregulated utility industry. And then people have said to me, how have you done? I've said, oh, I'm fine. I'm a part of a co-op out here. We've got a co-op under LCRA and we have no problem whatsoever. We're even part owners of our utility company out here. It is, uh, you know, it, it is ours, it, you know, and I like to use that. And that to me is what the notion of, of the fully functioning society is where the interests of some do not dominate the interests of others. One of the problems that I often have with radical activism is that they either have an interest that is so broad that we don't have no idea what it is, and that was a part of what Tony was talking about a while ago, or an interest that is so extreme that it is inconceivable as how it could be the unifying principle of a society. 
and it's too idealistic. Well, that to me is also the great fault with two-way symmetrical communication, because I think that there is at times when an awfully good asymmetrical argument is just exactly what puts a community right. And Jim and Grunig and I have agreed a long time ago never to make that a public issue where the two of us are together at the same time. <laughs> because we come at this from a very, very, very different sense. I'm an old public address guy. And I believe that, it, you know, you stand up and you state your case. And if you get somebody that goes along with you, you've made progress. And if you're booed off the stage, you didn't have a good day. And I think that's the nature of community. I, I go back to the notion of, of, of self-regulation, self-governance. I like to use terms like those. And therefore, I, I'm quite happy to have companies communicate with us with all of their power, all of their money, all their resources. But ultimately, it is the community that decides what we think is good for us, what, what really is, is right. And we've skewed that in the United States to such an extent that we've, you know, we've opened the door to some of these radicals in, in some of these issues. Uh, I belong to a group called the Corporate Relations Roundtable and everybody in there at one time or another, and some of them their entire careers out of Houston, made their living out of the oil and gas industry. And a few of them have now realized that there has to be constructive change. And one of my friends at Chevron said, we told you that a long time ago. <laughs> so even within an industry, uh, it takes time to have discourse move toward a new sense of the future, but it's all in what can the society, what can the community sustain in terms of, of shared interest, shared meaning. And shared meaning to me is, is, is so important so that we all agree what are, our, what are our first principles, what are our ultimate uh, standards of what we have as the way of being a decent, a decent society, you know. I'm, that, I'm, I'm a farm boy at heart, a small town farm boy from Colorado. <laughs> uh, a quick example of that. My dad died when I was just a, a sophomore in, in high school, we, I mean, in college. Um, and so we had a little farm and we had to you know, do some things to get mom out of that farm and so forth. Because I wasn't going to go back to that farm. And so my uncle helped her to sell the cattle and to begin to sell the place. But we also had a stack of baled hay. And so my uncle negotiated for a fairly affluent guy to come and buy the hay. And so he bought the hay, but he didn't buy all of the hay. And he tore the hay stack up and took only the hay out of the middle of the stack. Now, those of you that are not farmers know that's not right. That you don't do that just because you can do that. And so that farmer went to the grocery store within the next few days, got his little cart, his groceries, and he started to check out. And the grocer said, oh, we're not selling groceries today. He said, well, why not? And he said, you sold them to the person in front. And said, yeah, but we just quit selling them. Well, what about the people behind me? What are you going to do? He said, well, we may start selling them again. You mean to say you're not selling groceries to me? Ah, you got it. So the guy went across the street to get gasoline in his pickup. That was back in the days where you didn't do self. You had somebody pump the gasoline for you. The guy said, we're not selling gasoline today. And so the rich guy said, what in the hell is going on here? And the guy said, you take advantage of a widow of me. And you got to make a public apology. you got to pay her money. you got to put her haystack back together. Now that to me is community. That's community. It may be communism. I don't know. Maybe socialism. It may be environmentalism. I don't know. But that to me is community where people say, we're in this together. What can we do that you know leads at the end of the day all of us to be a good place to live, a good place to work? And communism is, is, is not when people are together. That's right. That's I know that's, that too. That's exactly the opposite. Believe me, well, I, 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 I was raised during the communism. 
Well, and I, and I have recently reread, and it's a long book, the book on Chernobyl. Midnight mm -hmm. in Chernobyl, I think is the name of it. And you talk about a society that got everything wrong that it could possibly get wrong. And all because- You know, it in, 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 in Kiev, they sent people for demonstra for manifestation. I, yeah. I lived, as that time I lived in, the, I was in army and I didn't manage to call to my family. That was yeah. simply, they cut the lines. They, yeah. they didn't allow people to, to even have a phone conversation. Yes, and you were told what your obligation was when it came to cleaning it up too. Mm -hmm. You had no choice. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, 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 the, and, the, and the Russian government had to come out of it looking as good as it possibly could because its whole notion that the atom was its future. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's right. It's true. Yeah. Okay, we can okay. keep going with this. Is there any, uh, did you want to go back to any key things from your notes? I know Bobby had a lot of stuff you wanted to talk about. Is there anything you want to go back to? Well, the only one thing that I would recommend to people if they can find a copy of it, there is a wonderful book, uh, article in one of the first three or four issues of, of Public Relations Review. It's by Rex Harlow. And Rex Harlow defined public relations in a way that I think is about as good as anybody ever did. And I'm the only one that ever uh, quotes Rex anymore. So I will quote him again. And I, uh, and this was written in 1976 in Public Relations Review. And it was when a bunch of the leading practitioners got together and they were launching, launching that journal, which really started off as practitioners telling the world how smart each of them was. And this to me is one of the best, <laughs> if not the best definitions that I ever read. Public relations is a distinctive management function which helps establish and maintain mutual lines of communication, understanding, acceptance, and cooperation. Throw all four of those together and you've got a sense of community, I think. Communication, understanding, acceptance, and cooperation between an organization and its publics. It involves the management of problems or issues. So Tony and I got our bit in there. Helps management to keep informed on and responsive to public opinion. Defines and emphasizes the responsibility of management to serve the public interest. So John Hill got his bit in there. Helps management keep abreast of and effectively utilize change serving as an early warning system, issues management again, to help anticipate trends and uses research and sound and ethical communication techniques as its principal tools. That's on page 36. <laughs> uh, I think that's an awfully good definition of public relations. And it was by a practitioner that came out of that generation that started at the first part of the of the uh, 20th century in the United States. And it really is a very, you know, thoughtful, it's a very in information, it's a very understanding, it's a very appreciative of, of others. You know, I think those are the qualities of public relations at its very, very best. Now, you might say that's pretty idealistic. And I think that's the notion of, a, of, a, of, of any profession is that it ought to have an idealistic, but a realistic sense of itself. What can it do? What can it accomplish? And how can it do that? And when we get too far away from those kinds of ideas, we've lost what is that thing that we call public relations, that process that goes back to the dawn of humans. Humans have always used some kind of, of communication effort to work together, to fight, to argue, to kill each other. And I guess we're stuck with that forever, but somewhere in there, there is the notion, it's like medicine, that there are good doctors that can do research and solve problems and even put such uh, catastrophes as the smallpox and the uh, Spanish flu and Ebola and COVID behind us. Mm 
and that we get on and we can go on to doing the things that we want to do. And I find, for instance, in our time that merely opening restaurants as an answer to an epidemic uh, never seemed to be terribly smart to me. <laughs> no matter how difficult it was for people, it wasn't very smart, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I'm so pleased to have spent time with all of you. I hope that some of the things that I've said are clear and lucid and maybe even inspiring. I hope I wasn't entirely too dominating. He was I know that I can be that way at times. Uh, one of the problems of getting to be my age is that you feel that you've probably said it somewhere if you can just remember where you said it. <laughs> I have 38 or 39 chats. Now, Michael, you're my guide. Should I at some point turn attention to those chats uh, independent of all the other people that are here or are those things that I should open up and see if somebody's got something that they really want to stump me with there? I think everybody's uh, raised their hand and asked their questions, but some people had trouble uh, with their, uh, you know, technology and couldn't okay. get Okay, all right, okay, good. I didn't want to leave anybody out. Well, I wish all of you well in all of what you're about to do or doing. Okay, thank you. And thank you for having Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.